morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would turn your Bibles to Psalm 51, that's where we'll get started this morning. Psalm 51. To prepare us for our worship service. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you'd like to, please stand. I'm seeing heavenly sunlight. Heavenly sunlight. Some first and last verses. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep hill. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise thee my
till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll sing the first and last verses of this song. We'll have our open prayer this morning. Oh, land of rest for the ice island. song invitation this morning will be just as I am just as I am and this song before scripture reading and then our lesson will be our God he is alive our God he is alive so the first and last verses of the song there is beyond the edge of earth a God concealed from you he did disguise with heavenly
scripture reading this morning will be from Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. so good to have you this morning. Hope that you had a good week. Hope that you got plenty of sleep and some tryptophan in you. Uh, just hope that you had a good positive week this week and just glad to see you this morning. There's a, bit, a lot of good things happening in Mount Zion and we're just appreciate that you're a part of that. One of my favorite things to do is confuse people. I have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, that probably sounds bad on the front end. I don't think it's good for your preacher to say that I, he likes to confuse you. Um, but it's one thing that's real fun to go three weeks lessons and talk to you about how you're supposed to be content, right? You're supposed to be happy with the things that are in your life, that you're supposed to be joyous, that you're supposed to find bounty in it, that the Lord has taken care of you. But then you always throw in that one odd sermon where you said, I am not content. You know, I'm not, I'm not happy with something. Uh, because it would be ludicrous to assume that we are absolutely content with absolutely everything in our life. There are things that I will argue today you should not be content with in your life. That you should not find pleasure or happiness or uh, any type of good in what you do or in how you live. Not in every single part. I mean, the Lord has blessed us and we ought to be content with the things that he's given us. Money in our bank accounts, a roof over our head, a car to drive. Um, there are those that don't have those things, and yet they wish that they were where we are. Uh, the Lord has blessed us, and so therefore, because he's blessed us, because we know he will bless us, it is uh, important for us to be content with the things that he blesses us with, that we should look at them as a gift of God. But, you know, there are some things that I'm not excited about in my life. There are things that I wish that I could do different. There are some attitudes that I have in my life, and maybe that you have in yours, where when you look at them, you're thinking, I wish that I was a better man or a better woman. I, I just wish that I could be somebody different sometimes. You know, maybe there are actions or things that you do in your everyday life that you wish, I wish that I'd quit that bad habit. I wish that I'd get completely rid of that. Now, that seems to be a trivial thing to the things that we'll talk about this morning, and yet there are things that I think that we shouldn't be content with. In our life, there are things that we need to understand are not supposed to be in our lives, and we're not supposed to continue in them forevermore. The first one that I think that we shouldn't be content with is that we shouldn't be content with people that are lost. Uh, for Shelton, this is the time you click the button. Thank you. Uh, for, uh, Shelton's got my button this morning. He's sitting back there with his brand new fiance, and so she's here, so go and bother her a lot. And, uh, but thank you, Shelton, for clicking that. I'm not to be content with people being lost. There are people in the world who do not know even the name of Jesus. And I'm not talking about just in foreign countries. That's almost obvious that there are those who are in other countries. You can ask missionaries to India and Haiti and, and South America and, and China and all these different types of places where you will ask them about Jesus and they will not know who you are talking about. There are people who are lost today who do know the name Jesus, and yet they don't know how Jesus affects and influences their life to live, better, to live better. There are those who do know the name Jesus. They have been a Christian before, and quite possibly they continue to go to church, and yet they are continuing to be lost. Because despite what they do here on Sundays and on Wednesdays, they don't know how to truly live for God. They don't know how to live their life the way that God desires them to. And Jesus' purpose and mission, well, one of them at least, is to come, as he says in Luke 19, verse 10, to come to seek and save that which is lost. That story specifically is of Zacchaeus, a tax collector who is going into a tree to make sure that he sees Jesus. And he looks around and he finds Jesus, and Jesus spots him and wants to eat a meal with him. And everybody's wondering, why, why are you doing this? What, what are you doing this for? Why are you meeting with someone like him? It's because Zacchaeus is repentant. 
He is one that wants to turn towards the kingdom of God. He wants to be a part of Jesus' kingdom, and he wants to join him in his mission. And that's where Jesus shows his purpose. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. A, a quote that we can even find probably in Ezekiel. We talked about this a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Ezekiel 34. The shepherds are not taking care of the sheep. Actually, in the opposite, form, in the opposite they are eating the sheep. They are misusing and abusing the sheep. And what do the sheep do? But they scatter and they go about into their different regions and they get separated from each other, just like they do in exile. But how will they get brought back together? Through the Lord, the Lord coming down and the Lord gathering his sheep to the fold, gathering them so that they are together once again to seek and save the lost. Jesus will say in another instance in Matthew, he will say that the, the well do not need a physician, but the sick do. And we know that there are plenty of sick. There's plenty of sick to go around that Jesus can't heal. A good example, Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. If you'd like to turn your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, this is in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, in the moment he stops and he looks at the crowds and he says... Or he has compassion on them. This is the emotion that gets brought up. This compassion. This looking at the people and recognizing that they need help. They looked harassed, helpless. No one was there to be there for them. No one was there to comfort them or to help them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Another instance that we could look at Ezekiel chapter 34. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's a little bit different. He uses a couple of different metaphors here, talking about sheep and then also talking about harvest. But it still stays the same. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There are a lot of people who are lost. And I don't want to be content with that. I don't want to be content with the idea that there are people out there who do not know the name Jesus. A name that we comfort each other by in this very room. A name in which gives us and inspires in us hope and excitement. Visions of love and visions of care. And yet we can become content with the lost being lost and the saved being saved. And I don't want to be content with that. I don't want to be content with that because God himself is not content with that. If you turn your Bibles to John chapter 3, a well-known passage, one that, I could probably, that most of you could probably quote. It's John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, I'm just looking at Ezekiel everywhere. You can even see in here Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel 18 where he says, I don't desire to see people perish and die. I don't desire to see people being punished for sins that they could be saved from. I don't want to see people suffer and lose out on eternal life because of sin in the world. That's not what God wants. God wants and loves his people, loves his creation so much that he would send his only begotten son that they might die. That he might die for them. That he cares and loves the people of the world. He cares and loves for your enemy. He cares and loves for your next door neighbor. He loves and cares for your family members who do not know Jesus. And are separated from him. I can't be content with the lost being lost. I can't be content with the idea that there are people that don't know the name which is above all other names. What it looks like when I'm content with there being lost people is I never speak of my faith. I never speak about the truth of God's word. When people see that we are Christians, they'll know us by our love. They'll know, notice by our generosity and our care, which are outputs of love. They will know by the kind words that we say to one another. They will know by the actions and the motives that we have behind everything because we care about people. But if we never speak of that, 
If we never speak about our faith, if we never speak about how God has influenced and changed our lives, then we are content with people being lost. I'm content with people being lost when I never seek to invite people to know Jesus or even invite them to come to church. I'm content with there being people who are lost when I don't desire for them to see any bright light in me. Where they see no truth in the way that I communicate. When they see no liveliness in what my faith produces in me. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And yet do they see us in anger and anxiety and in hopelessness and in tiredness. Do they see us as people just struggling to make it by. Even though we have a living God who told us the end of the story. When I am content with people being lost. I will never show them the true and bright light that shines, that Jesus allows to be shown in me. Not only do I not want to be content with people who are lost, but I am not content with Satan's presence. I'm not content with him being in my life. I'm not content with him being a part of my day-to-day -day walk. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the picture I chose up here is of uh, a lion. And I... You know, as I was thinking about, this is free, by the way. This is a cost. I actually find it confusing almost to show a picture of this lion because I think of the lion of Judah. I think of Jesus being this lion, of, of, this, uh, of the lion of Judah who's going to attack and help us and bless us. And he's going to be this vicious animal to destroy sin. And yet Satan himself is described as being a hungry, ravenous lion, just seeking and just walking, ready to devour whoever is next. Finding us in our weakness, finding us in the moments where we need God the most, that is where Satan will find us. That is where Satan will come on the prowl trying to get us to fail, trying to get us to act in ways that we shouldn't act. A good example of this, if you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, all these passages that we're reading today are very, very common. There's nothing uh, new under the sun here in a moment like this. And so I hope that you'll bear with me. But Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I want to believe that Matthew mentions specifically that he was hungry to reassure us and to lead us to understand Jesus' humanity. You know, it's odd to talk about hunger in a week where our goal is to eat as much as possible and have as many leftovers as possible. It feels kind of weird to talk about that when you have probably like eight pounds of stuffing in your refrigerator right now and you don't know what to do with it. You know, it's weird to talk about hunger. And yet in those moments of starvation, in those moments of hunger, what would you do after 40 days without food? What would you be willing to accomplish? What would you be willing to do for someone else if it meant that you could have a slice of bread or even a loaf of bread? Satan finds us in those weary, disastrous, lonely moments in our lives. Maybe we're not even starving for food, but maybe we're starving for, for, for help. We're starving for companionship. We're starving for of the things of life that make us human. We're starving for the things that make us happy. We're starving for the things that bring us full, make us full. And that is when Satan comes and he shows himself. That's when the tempter came and said to him in verse 3, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. It'd just be easy. If you can turn water to wine, you can turn stones into bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift, up you, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now listen to Jesus' words here. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Away from me, Satan. 
For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I want us to remember that this week. Away with you, Satan. Get away from me. I'm not content with your presence in my life. I'm not content with you being here in my midst. I'm not content with you being around me. I'm not content with your temptations. I'm not content with the things that you do to try to get me to fall off on a road that I shouldn't be on. In moments like this, it's easy to say that I won't be tempted this week. Or I don't even know what temptations came this week that I had to deal with. But in those moments, we know exactly when the temptations rise. We know exactly when those moments arise. Maybe it's the phone call with people that you shouldn't be around. Maybe it's those moments where you're alone and you know that I shouldn't be trusted alone. Maybe it's in those moments where you seek to get the juicy gossip or you say the angry word to somebody because they feel the same pain that you feel. And you just want to express your anger and express your frustration. And you wish you could curse this person. And you wish you could curse them to no end. You wish that you could just say what was on your mind. And yet those temptations leave us not in an encouraging motivation. But one of destruction. One in which we see people as objects of our rage. But how do we fight this off. How do we fight Satan's presence? Well, in Ephesians chapter 6, if you'll go there, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us exactly what we're supposed to do to get rid of the evil one and to prepare ourselves for the evil one. And it is that we put on the whole armor of God. We put on righteousness. We put on truth. We put on the, the preparedness to spread the gospel. We put on to our arm the shield of faith. Notice this in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 6. Notice that why do you put on the shield of faith? Because with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You can put on salvation. You can put on, carry the word of God. But in the end, it's to protect us from Satan. It's to protect us from the evil one. It's to protect us from the one who wishes to put us down in the moments when we are at our lowest. And I don't want to be content with that low moment. Because the way that we are not content with Satan's presence, what we do is we fill the void with God's presence. We fill the void with God's presence and God's motives. We do everything that we can to fill our minds and to fill our hearts with God himself. We don't leave it to be said that, oh, well, never mind, you know, I don't have God. I'm just going to try and do this all by myself. We have to kick Satan out, away with me, Satan, and to say, come, Lord, come. Come, Lord, come. I will say, what does it look like to be content with Satan's presence? I think what it looks like when I'm content with, the, with, with Satan's presence is that I continue to act like the rest of the world. I do what the rest of the world does. I share in the world's anxieties. I share in the world's fears. I share in the world's hopelessness. And I create more of a void for God. You see, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but he gave us a spirit of self-control. He gave us a spirit of hope. He gave us a spirit of love. He gives us these spirits so that we can fight the battles that Satan puts before us. He gives us these talents and these abilities so that we could go about living our daily lives knowing that God is with me no matter what. Lo, Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That the Lord is with his people. The Lord is with the ones that call themselves his. Another way that I'm content with Satan's presence is that I do not seek to find biblical solutions to my problems. I don't try to find out what the Bible has to say about the, what's going on in my life. I just go to my friends and my neighbors who are not Christians or people who don't know what they're talking about or people who have not become wise because of God's word. 
If there's problems in my marriage, if there's problems in the things that, uh, that we're doing in our marriage, the last person I want to ask is my friend at work who's been divorced three or four times. The last person that I want to talk to about my struggle may be a guy that's my same age or a girl that's the same age. That maybe I don't want to talk to a friend or somebody else about the thing that I'm experiencing. Maybe I need to find an older, wiser person who would be able to guide me, to point me in the directions of God, and to say, you know what? You would really grow by reading this passage. You would really grow by reading this book of the Bible, because this book of the Bible is something that would really help you in these moments of loneliness, in these moments of fear, in these moments of anxiety, in these moments of stress, whatever it might be, where Satan wants to get you and grab you and then turn you into his own. In those moments, wisdom from an older man or an older woman would be just right at home. I'm not content with Satan's presence. I'm not content with people being lost. I'm not content with Satan's presence. And I'm not content with my own sin. I can't be content with my own sin. Because then I am not a child of God. I think Romans chapter 7 is a good example of this. If you turn back to Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 is a difficult passage to read. There's a lot there. But Romans really has an in-depth Understanding of sin as it relates to the Christian walk. Uh, chapters 1 through about chapter 9 or chapter 8 is all about how Jesus is rescuing us from our sin. Uh, when I actually took a class at Heritage about Romans, uh, a good buddy of mine who now lives in Texas, he, he talked about how Romans feels like an emotional roller coaster. It's just ups and downs the entire way. Once you feel like you're at the bottom and you feel like, man, all I am is just a sinful person. And man, I can't do anything. But then the roller coaster goes up and you feel like, man, God is the one who blesses me. God is the one who rescues me. And the law of sin or the law and sin uh, in Romans chapter 7 feels a little bit like at these low moments. Because what it's talking about is that here I am as a person, as a, as a child of God, and one of the things that I still struggle with is my sin. I still struggle and I still have these temptations in these moments where I want to turn away from God and I want to go towards my sin. And yet Paul warns us and lets us know about the truth of sin. Notice this in verse, chapter 7 and verse 4. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to one to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now there's going to be two images. One is that this Jesus who died gives us the ability to bear fruit for God. But look at the opposite tree. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. It's kind of like an oxymoron. Like, right? You can't bear fruit for death. The object of bearing fruit is specifically life. Because fruit gives us life. It gives us nourishment. It helps us. It blesses those around them. The tree, the pear tree or the apple tree that grows in its season and grows exactly the way it's supposed to go, uh, grow is exactly what helps a community to thrive and to become brand new. But if you're just a dead tree and you're just a tree that produces more and more death, you're worthless. In fact, Jesus will say when he talks about being the vine, he will say that it's better to be pruned of those trees. It's better to be pruned of those vines so that the whole branch can make it. Look at verse 6. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I want us to move down all the way. I mean, how did Paul look at himself when it came to sin and when it came to God? Well, I think the passage that Samuel read for us just a few minutes ago was a good example of this. Verse 24. What a wretched man I am. When we think about sin and when we think about what sin can do to us, when we think about sin's uh, actions, not only against us, not only against our brains, not only against our neighbors, not only against the people in our community, not only the, what it does to the entire world as a whole, sin destroys, sin breaks, sin takes away. Sin cannot provide anything good. 
Sin cannot provide anything that is beneficial. And when Paul sees himself a part of this sin, he says, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man that I am. How can I be content with something that makes me so wretched? Something so disgusting, something so gross. What, how can I be content with something and how can I stick my hands into something else that makes me into a disgusting and terrible person? Not only just for me, but for those around me. How can I stick to sin? How can I, how can I continue within it? I can't. I can't be content with it. it Paul will even say in chapter 6, if you remember, chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. I mean, the question is, God's bountiful grace is so good. Since God's grace is so good, since God's grace is so amazing, since God can lavish his grace over all people, well, then it really shouldn't matter if we sin or not, because God's grace is so amazing and it's so wonderful and that he can bless it upon all of us. Shouldn't we keep sinning so that we can continue to experience God's wonderful, bountiful grace? And Paul's answer is absolutely not. Certainly not. This is in verse 2. By no means we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? When you've died to something, how can you go back to that life? How can you go back to that way of living? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Just like Jesus lives, so can we when we exit those waters. That we reenact the death of Jesus when we come up out of the waters and now we live in the newness of life. And yet here I am, or here we are, Content with our mistakes. Content with the things that keep us separated from God. Content with those things that cause us to sin even more. How do I know when I am content with my own sin? What does that look like? I don't know when all this started, and maybe you continue to hear prayers like this. I've heard prayers like this before. I can't remember any off the top of my head, but I know this phrase has been said, talked about. Forgive us for the things that we don't know that we do. Right? Forgive us for the sins in which we commit, that we are human, we are frail, and that we continue to sin. And we sit in this room and we'll pray that God forgives us of our continual sin. And yet in our outside lives, we forget the prayer. And we continue to go in sin. A, da a dangerous thing that we do is we give ourselves room. We actually will give ourselves a little gray area. We give, our, we give ourselves a little gray area in which we say to ourselves, well, at least I'm not killing anybody. I'm not like one of them. I'm not stealing. I'm not doing anything that hurts anybody. I'm not doing anything that, that, that hinders somebody from growing or whatever. But I'll just commit this little tiny sin. And maybe we don't even tell ourselves this. We just do it because we have viewed it as okay. God is going to allow me to be all right. He, he, he loves me and he cares for me. And yet we continue to sin expecting that grace to be abound. When I'm content with my sin, I will misuse the term faithfulness. I will misuse the term faithfulness to mean something that looks like this. Well, I go to church, I give my money, I sing the songs, I say the prayers, and yet when I walk out the door, all those guys that I work with, they just continue to act that way around me because I've given them reason to. I've opened the door for Satan to, to fill and be in my presence. I continue to fall into the same traps that I always fall into, whether it be that, I, that I, I'm around the people that I don't need to be around, whether I have the things that I shouldn't have, whether I do the things that I know I shouldn't do. I fall into the same traps and I allow those little mistakes to move me. I think reading 1 John would be a good example of this. If you would, turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 
Notice what John says here, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, this is in verses 5 and 6. This is the message we have heard before him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. We can't have a God who has darkness in him. Then we're not serving a truly good God. The God that we serve has no darkness in him. In fact, read the next line, verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him... Yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. When you come here today, continuing to fall into the same temptations and the same traps that you always fall into, and come in here and believe that I am a child of God without any desire to change, without any desire or any, anything, anything within us that says that I need to be different, then we are walking in darkness. If we continue in this life desiring to change nothing about ourselves, desiring to change nothing about our attitudes, our behaviors, and to look more Christ-like, if we do not desire to do that, then we are content with our sin. And I don't want you to be content with your sin. If you would go back to Psalm 51, I think it's a good closing as we kind of conclude. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, as you know, is a psalm where David's ashamed of what he did. He's ashamed of how he's acted. He's ashamed of how he's lived. It's a repentant psalm. It's a psalm in which he looks and says, you know what? I, man, I need God to wash me and to cleanse me and to make me whole. Verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. It's always looking at me. It's looking straight at me. And I know how terrible it is against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Go down to verse 7. How do we get rid of this problem? What do we do to change this so that I'm no longer content with my sin, but I get rid of it? And I say, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to have that problem anymore. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me. And I will be whiter than snow. I'll be whiter than snow. This morning you have an opportunity to be washed. You have an opportunity to be cleansed. This morning if you're content with your sin. That may look like today. You sitting down. Knowing that there's something, knowing that there's things that I need to be forgiven of, things that are public that I need to receive forgiveness from God for. It may be that you know you need to be baptized. You know that without baptism, you will not see the Father. And you will still continue to have your sins upon you. And this morning, if you're content with that, if you're fine with that, sit down. Stay seated. Stay in your pew. But if you're not content with your sin, if you're not content with living a life that you've always lived, won't you come now? Just together we stand here as we sing. Just as I am.
little communion with the Lord at this time, if you would bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've blessed us with this opportunity to commune with you each first day of the week. And Lord, as we prepare to take this bread, through which your faith represents the body of Christ that hung on the cross for our sins, we pray we remember the great love that's shown toward us, the great sacrifice that's made on our behalf. May we take it in the way that we please in your sight. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you now, give thanks for this fruit of vine, which has represented us as Christians, as your son's blood that he willingly shed on the cross for our sins. Let's take it away now that will be well-pleasing, uplifting to you. Dry snack. Amen.
supper and the pardon line. Uh, our Lord's Supper was commanded to give and what do so at this time. Let us bow. Father, again, we thank so much for all many blessings. Father, we thank for your help and uh, uh, many opportunities uh, uh, to work and provide, Lord. Uh, Father, at this time, as we give, we will give in a well pleasing manner unto you. Sing, I'll be listening, and we'll be dismissed to our classes. <laughs> when the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will be here. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my day. Somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my. 